Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 383, the very casual post-Holy Week, post-Holy Holy Week edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's the 10th of April, 2018. What's going on? Where is that crisp image we have of Gavin? Well, Gavin's <laughs> at his castle in France right now, and he doesn't have real fast internet there. He's had quite a day. You you already flattened a tire on your bike today. It's not a castle. It's an old mill. <laughs> it's an old the mill. boiler doesn't work, and I've, and I've been washing in cold water, which I wouldn't have mind doing in Lent, but I think it's a bit rich to do it in Easter season. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm mending things that are broken, and one of the things that broke today were my tyres as I cycled into the local town, uh, going down a hill. Uh, and and amazingly, there was the, the bike was shop in bike shop in town, and they 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 took the bikes, they they fixed it in an hour, and uh, and then I cycled home saying, Lord, thank you that I have two new inner tubes, and then then the heavens opened and it poured with rain, <laughs> which is what it does in Normandy, yes, and I did all I could think of. I hope. I hope the internet's okay for Kevin when I get back. <laughs> it, it'll do fine. Uh, we had the most forgiving audience ever. I mean, it's unscripted for crying out loud. Uh, people don't always hear what they hear or see what they see or understand what they understand, but we get to say it anyway. Um, lots of news going on. It's been uh, almost two weeks since we spoke last, and I thought yeah. we would talk about some uh, things I saw coming out of uh, England, especially the day of Easter, because this is where people get to test what they feel about the resurrection when they stand up uh, in front of their congregations. And boy, I've heard some doozies all around the world. Uh, we like to post those stories on my Facebook page. And one Bishop of Wales said or did not say there is no resurrection. It's not what you think it is. It's more of a it's a thing that happened type of thing. And I'm like, oh, boy. Well, the one person I know who can tell me what the English and the Irish really think would be Gavin. Um, tell me what the Bishop of Wales was really trying to infer about the resurrection, which you and I fully believe happened, right? <laughs> yes. just, let, let me be it's, up front here, people. So... <laughs> there would be no understanding of the Trinity. Peter would not have launched into uh, the, the Acts the way he did. There would be no anything without uh, the resurrection. Uh, our whole theology of the last 200 years is based on the solid understanding that Christ was bodily resurrected from death. <sighs> it's very strange that, in, yeah. that, that Anglicans in the British Isles seem to have leaders who, I think they're in awe to the intellect. So the, the, the shadow of the 19th century German theologian still hangs over them. And they, it's not exactly what they, the, the, the precise words they use. Even, even Bishop Jenkins of Durham was, was um, uh, sophisticatedly careful with the words he used. It's the tone they bring to it. So Archbishop Davies said, he said, we don't really know what happened. Now, he wasn't denying there was a resurrection. He was just uncomfortable with it. And uh, in one sense, of course, um, how is it possible that we who live in time and space can begin to conceive what, how, how the resurrection body works as it, as it comes through walls and eats fish, as, mm -hmm. it, as, it, as, it, as Thomas can, can put his fingers in the wounds, as Jesus can walk on the sand at a, at a barbecue. Of course we can't understand it. But if you want to explain to the people you live with that uh, there is forgiveness of sins, there is life after death, there is hope because Jesus was risen, you don't do it by saying, hey, you know, the most important thing is I can't get my head around the physical details, which is essentially what the Archbishop of Wales made the center point of his Easter message. I've always been told, and I've always told you know, people I, I help disciple, you tell them what you know, you never tell them what you don't know. And you don't tell them you don't know what you uh, don't know. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yes. Hopefully there's not well, you much just, you, you don't just, know. You just wonder what you, I mean, you can't help but wonder what kind of faith they have when they, what they want to do is to confess their doubts to people. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the fact is that, that if you're born again, if you've been forgiven your sins, if, if Jesus walks with you every day, what is not on your mind is, is, is the 
enlightened physicalities of, of the mechanics of the resurrection. You know, and, and I was at a dawn service uh, on Easter Sunday. It's it's really lovely. Uh, I live in the hills in way in near near Wales, and there were about fifteen people from different churches who got up on a very very cold morning, and uh, at dawn, about a quarter past six, and stood on the hills to sing some hymns, and it was lovely. Um, and we came, there were, there were Catholics, Anglicans, Methodists there, and, and I don't know everyone there very well. So I asked where they came from. Uh, and this one guy said, uh, oh, well, he said, I don't really go to church. I'm here to support my mother. Uh, I'm, I'm a sort of, I'm sympathetic towards Christianity. And I said, what does that mean? <laughs> here we are in the dawn service. Now. What do you mean sympathetic? Oh, he said pompously, I think I take the view that Gandhi does. That, that there's nothing in the, he said, there's nothing in the Vedas that isn't in the Gospels. And I said, Gandhi was an idiot. He's he's not bad at passive resistance no. in terms of getting the British out of India. Uh, and he said some wonderful clever things like, you know, what do you think of British civilization, Mr. Gandhi? I think it would be a good thing if it happened. But 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 his understanding of the risen Christ was seriously flawed. So I said to this guy, I want to tell you about the risen Jesus no, so that you understand that what's in the Gospels is not in the Vedas. And I said, if you find that's a bit heavy at half past six in the morning, you shouldn't come to Christian worship that celebrates the resurrection of Jesus and not expect to be evangelized. So here we go. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, <clears throat> they've, they've all died. Every movement leader, uh, whoever started a sect, a religion, whatever, they all died. Jesus died too. We, we got to admit that. However... Ours is different, Christianity, because Jesus came back from the dead. He was resurrected. That's the single difference. Not the single difference. That's the amazing difference that sets us apart from all other religions on the earth. And that's why our priests and our bishops and, and all baptized people need a particular Easter to stand up and say, it's completely different. It really happened. It's amazing. Pin your ears back. Yeah. And if we don't have the Easter, the, the joy and the awe and the amazement, uh, then of course people will have a sense that it's just another spring ritual. But the teaching that's gone on in the West is that everything is more or less the same. This is just another religion. Uh, it, I mean, uh, we, we might talk later on about Prince Charles and his, um, uh, his own Easter message because he slips into the same, the same mistake and you, you, uh, well, you do wish people were better informed. Before we go there, okay, people probably figured out by now that uh, the Ministry of Anglican TV is to encourage one another to bring video to introduce you to the, the leaders and makers within the church. We also are a critic of the church, uh, the broken church. And one of my criticisms of a place like England and the Church of England is you guys raise up the most famous atheist uh, the world has ever seen. And I'm like, is that, you know, is that really what the Church of England is going to be known for? The Stephen Hawking's, the Christopher Hitchinson's, the, the, you know, the, just go on down the line. And I'm like, well, that's not what I want to be famous for. It is uh, the, we, it, again. It's a matter of the impression we give. Mm -hmm. So Stephen Hawkins is having his ashes buried in Westminster Abbey because he was such a faithful Christian and in awe of the risen Christ and an, and affirmed all the values of the Holy Church and and its mystery. You know, of course, he didn't. He did none of those things. He was one of the most uh, he was one of the most powerful atheists who thought he was close to knowing the mind of God when, in fact, of course, he could know no such thing. But it's again, it's astonishing that the church should as a matter of cultural or intellectual respect say well you belong in here and what I love about uh, about the Eastern churches is that that instead of being having uh, their walls decorated with war memorials and family plaques and and, and and matters of artifacts of social status they decorate their churches with the Saints you know it's all about the Saints but there's something about Anglicanism and the Church of England in particular that cannot shake its awe of the state and of the intellect and of secular culture and and you know no wonder people get the impression that um, uh, that we're as crazy about secular society as we are about the risen Jesus all right let's move on to some viewer email uh, and comments we got uh, first uh, comment uh, is why don't you guys have podcasts 
Now, we do Anglican TV and Anglican Unscripted in video form. Uh, we could uh, uh, port it to podcast and deliver it on the internet as well. Uh, the biggest issue is any t- time I have to host a podcast somewhere, I have to pay for that hosting, and that's 20 or 30 40 dollars a month that I just don't have. Uh, however, if podcast people who really want to listen to this on their uh, iPads or iPhones or whatever podcast units they have want to start donating to help building up a, a little uh, kitty for uh, uh, that type of expense, that would be great. Kevin, your email system is not working. I'm not getting emails uh, anymore. I started the email system. It was a free little program 10 years ago. And over time, people have changed email addresses. They've not told the system that those email addresses are changed. So they're bouncing off empty emails. And Google and Yahoo and everybody just puts me in spam right away when you start you know, having 10 or 15 mm. things. Mm. So we no longer offer email updates. If you want to be notified when the show is available, go to YouTube where you see that you're watching right now on the lower left-hand corner, subscribe. Hit that red button and you will get notified instantly when uh, there's a new video available. All right, let's talk a little bit about slavery. That was the topic I saw in a letter passed around by bishops after Easter. Now, slave to sin is a gospel teaching, but uh, slavery itself, I don't know. What, what, did you see this letter? I, I did see it, okay. and I was surprised by it because I, I have to, to admit, Kevin, I've been irritated over the last 30 years. As, um, as in the Church of England, we've been arguing about gender uh, and progress. One of the arguments that, uh, that the progressives have always put out was, you know, we've got rid of slavery. Uh, that was a piece of cultural barbarism. We're now well beyond it. And that's why we can get rid of a whole load of other cultural barbarisms in the church, too, mainly arguing about, about the gender wars. And I thought to myself, of course you haven't got rid of slavery. Slavery comes out of human fallen nature. It's a piece of enormous hubris to imagine that in this, just because we have a pocket in time, when you don't see it on your streets, it's not there. And of course, what's happened in the last three or four years is with people trafficking, finally it is back. It was always there, but now it's back on our streets. Now, in a way, that the nice part about the bishops writing to the letters, the newspapers, saying, wouldn't it be nice if Christians kept an eye out for slaves? <laughs> and this is something we can do. It it just feels to be to be... And, and the suggestion was, the place to look for slaves are your car washes. Um, well, I never go to car washes because they cost too much money. I do it by hand. <laughs> but... I, I just what do you mean? You live in France. You just wait for the rain to come down. But okay, <laughs> <laughs> the rain brings the Africans sand from the Sahara. Um, I thought if you were going to have ten bishops writing to the newspaper to talk about slavery, what they should bring would be the, the, the sense of the Christian office freedom from the slavery of sin, from the slavery of the human condition. Um, we are not just another social agency. There are so many of those. Uh, and if, 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 if we're not talking about the slavery sin, who is? I mean, interestingly enough, uh, one of the reasons why people that people give for maintaining confidence in the Church of England are the few biblically orthodox bishops who they think they can look to and trust, who I have to say are remarkably quiet in public. And, and one of the orthodox bishops had put his name to this letter. And I just thought, you know, what are you doing? You should be writing about slavery of, of the spirit of the soul. Uh, and again, it just gives the impression that Christianity is another form of social work, another mm-hmm. concern for as a, as a refugee agency. That's not to say that if anybody has any experience, they shouldn't, as a matter of course, do something about it. But you don't need bishops writing letters to the newspapers telling people to do what common sense would dictate anyway. Um, so, it, and this was the Easter message that came across in the press. So they didn't talk about Jesus. No, no. And Kevin, they make me seem such a curmudgeon. You know, I want to congratulate the church on, on its enthusiasm, on its faith, on its... On its but but it, it doesn't give you many, many excuses. Of course, there are many faithful people we don't hear about who don't make the news, who are, who are 
loving the Lord and serving him. But uh, the ones who do make the news seem to manage to do it in a way that doesn't support the gospel particularly helpfully. Well, the future king of England made the news. I was going through my Facebook feed. <laughs> Every once in a while, I go on Facebook, you know, just to see what's going on. And I see uh, Prince Charles made a video where he uh, talked about the suffering Christians. And he went on, and he went on, and he went on, and he brought up the, the, the f fondness uh, Islam has for, for Mary. And uh, I, that's where I had to click stop. I need to talk to Gavin. Are they teaching something different over in England than they do with the rest of the world? Uh, I thought that that Mary that they were talking about in uh, uh, the Quran was a different Mary. So l let's straighten this up. First, thank you, Prince Charles, uh, future King of England, f future supreme person over our church for you know mentioning the suffering Christians. But you have to have this whole uh, understanding of uh, world religion uh, down path before you get in office, in my humble opinion. Uh, what's he missing? Well, as usual, he gives with one hand and, and, and takes to the other. So it was very important, and we should be very grateful in indeed yes, sir. that in his Easter message, uh, he made it clear that Christians are suffering like no other group. It's interesting, actually, Kevin, because one of the things that happened in, a, in some of the newspapers and journals is that people have begun to write about uh, suffering Muslims. Um, and, and, of course, Muslims do suffer for, in, um, in various places. The Rohingya Muslims are having a tough time, mainly because they've scared their Buddhist neighbors so much that Buddhists are trying to kick them out. But, but um, So we're grateful for Charles, Prince Charles doing that. But... Um, he's been a fan of Islam for his life, and uh, he couldn't resist, after he'd done this wonderful thing of drawing people's attention to the suffering of Christians, mainly at the hand of Muslims, though he didn't say that, <laughs> he then went on to say, and of course, you know, we have so much in common because, because Mary as Miriam is in the, is in the Quran, uh, and we're all part of the three Abrahamic faiths. And this is part of the whole relativism that our culture and our media thrust. But actually, uh, what Muhammad did was he, he, being jealous of the special revelation that Israel had had through the prophets, and hoping and longing for, a, for an Arab prophet, and he became that prophet, uh, he then borrowed, like borrowing someone else's homework, he, he borrowed the names of Abraham and of, of Isa, Jesus, and of Mary. But the Abraham and the Mary and the Jesus in the Quran are not remotely similar to the Abraham, the Moses and the Jesus in the two Testaments. And, and, and to pretend that they are is just to imagine that Islam is another religion. Uh, either uh, the angels that came to him got it right and the inspiration that came to the Jewish prophets and to our Lord got it wrong, in which case we must become Muslims as a matter of speed and obedience. Or it's the opposite, and the angels that came to him came to him with fake news and misinformation, in which case you mustn't compare them as if they were the same uh, to the, to the Judeo-Christian figures. Now, if, the, if, if Charles himself doesn't know that, or if he hasn't understood the Quran, or hasn't read it properly, uh, to set it side by side by the Gospels, well, we have a real problem of education in our country, because... Um, the idea that we have simply three cousinly Abrahamic faiths uh, papers over the most enormous fissures uh, and, and, and moral and ethical differences between uh, Christianity and Islam. And uh, we have to face those in order that people can make an educated choice between them. It's interesting because Muhammad, for most of his life, had inner conflict about whether these this prophetic message he was was getting from was you know, the Archbishop Gabriel or um, whoever um, or demonic and in the end he decided it was uh, uh, the Archb uh, Archbishop <laughs> the Archangel <laughs> 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 and history has set itself a, a, a glow because of that um, you know one of those things yes those were the satanic verses that Rushdie took to make his novel up. He did have this crisis in the middle uh, where um, he wondered whether the verses were indeed satanic. Uh, and I, I think what I find surprising is 
Uh, if you look at what Islam as a religion has done, it is the most bloodthirsty, uh, the most violent, uh, the most angry of religions. Of course, it has a beautiful side. The beginning of the Quran has some have some very irenic bits in it when Muhammad was getting on well in Mecca. But the Medina verses are, 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 are very serious indeed. And so um, one might wonder why uh, a religion where there is some doubt about where the revelation came from uh, and resorts to so much violence, one might join up the metaphysical dots. But again, I do think that in the West we live in the one of those religiously illiterate cultures that's ever happened. Um, because again, the education program has taught this relativistic trope that, um, uh, that, that things are just versions of each other and you cannot say one is better and the other is, is, is worse. And if you do stand up in public and say, there is a problem with Islam, not with Muslims. Muslims can be great people, but with a belief system, you're right on the edge in our culture anyway of, of creating a hate crime. And it's just going to get worse. I was reading a story of Easter from the Associated Press who mm. mentioned that you know, Jesus was famous because he never died. I read oh, it again. Well, that's, I, his, that's the Islamic heresy. Yeah. I read it again. And it says, you know, uh, people go to church on Easter because Jesus never died. And I'm like, oh boy. And it's just going to get worse because uh, we aren't sending our kids to church anymore. They're not uh, uh, going to catechism. Um, the culture is really becoming, I don't want to use the, the word tribulation, but we're getting there much faster than I, than I anticipated. I thought for sure it would be generations away. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and I wish you the joys of the Easter festival and the, of the resurrection. And you've been listening to episode 383 of Anglican Unscripted. Live from the castle. Ah, from the mill, <laughs> with a broken boiler <laughs> and very cold water. Thank you.